Father in heaven, as we come to open the book of Daniel once more, please bless us with wisdom and understanding. And I pray that you would give us the Holy Spirit to lead us into all truth. Be with us now as our prayer in Jesus' name. Amen. Just double checking that all phones are off or on silent. Okay, last class we looked at the daily already. We touched a bit of it and I gave you one proof to show how we can determine that the daily is at least a bad entity. Now we looked at the two main, main views in Adventism that we find in paganism and the high priestly ministry of Jesus Christ. One's good, one's bad. So we know that it can't have both views. There can't be a dual application. And from verse 13 in Daniel chapter 8, we already looked at how this word daily is grouped with what? What is it grouped with in verse 13 there? Transgression. The transgression of desolation. And then the other group, which says both, the sanctuary and the host to be trodden underfoot. So one is treading on the other. Transgression of desolation, we see clearly, clearly cannot be a good entity because the word transgression there already gives us the indication that this power is transgressing the law of God. Sin is a transgression of the law, 1 John 3, 4. We looked at that. So we looked at this first step, how we know that the daily cannot be a good entity. Now, the reason why we're emphasizing this is because when we understand the daily, we can see clearly the two phases of this little horn in Daniel 8. Now remember, Daniel 8, this little horn is not just papal Rome. If we compare it to Daniel 7, it is. But this little horn here in Daniel 8 has to be pagan and papal Rome. Why? Because right before that is the kingdom of Greece. And we know according to Daniel 2 and also Daniel 7, the kingdom that comes next is not the papacy, the, pagan, uh, the papal Rome. It is pagan Rome. Rome in its in its political entity. So the key to unlocking this and helping us to understand this little horn is our understanding of the daily. So we're, we already looked at the first proof, a first way at least we can see that this little horn is none other than both pagan and papal. And how we know that daily is what? Paganism. Now, now come with me to verse 12, okay? Verse 12 of Daniel 8. Now we're going to go through all these verses in succession again, and we'll see more clearly um, both of them together. Verse 12, okay? Let's read that. And an host was given him against the daily. Let's leave out the word sacrifice there. And an host was given him against the daily by reason of transgression, and it cast down the truth to the ground, and it practiced and prospered. Now, the hymn there is referring to the little horn again. But it says that an host was given him against a daily by reason of what? Transgression. The word there, transgression, is brought out again. But look, what I want to do is I want to read to you from a, a direct, literal translation from the Hebrew Bible, okay? Because what scholars did was, now I'm not going to read to you in Hebrew per se, but I'm going to read to you is direct, literal translation of verse 12 of Daniel 8, okay? It says, And the host shall be given upon the confident. Now that confident there is referring to what? The daily. Pardon me, the little horn there, the, the confident, okay? So the host shall be given upon the confident in iniquity. In iniquity. So when we look at this in verse 12, the King James Version, it tells us by reason of, of transgression. Another word for transgression there is iniquity. Sin is a transgression of the law. And in Isaiah 59 verses 1 and 2, it points out sin as also iniquity. Or what the Bible also says, the mystery of iniquity. So here we're looking at it. And in King James, it says by reason of transgression. But the little horn here goes against the daily in iniquity. Or what? Let me read it again in the Hebrew Bible. And the host shall be given upon the confidence in iniquity. Truly pointing out here that this power here, we established already in verse 10 that it was pagan Rome. But now it's changed. 
by reason of transgression in iniquity is changed form to more religious. And we see that also in Daniel 2 and 7. How in Daniel 7 it says it's what? It's diverse. Daniel 2, the element changes. Here it changes as well. Okay, that's the second way. We know at least the daily has got something to do with iniquity. All right? But let's look at the third thing. Now, if we go to verse 11 there, verse 11. Now, I'm going to emphasize, we're going to go through these verses in order, okay? But what we're just looking at here at the moment is the word daily. Because this word daily is the key to helping us to unlock this understanding of how this little horn can be both pagan and papal Rome in the same entity, the little horn. Now let's look at verse 11. Yea, he magnified himself even to the prince of the host, and by him the daily sacrifice was taken away, and the place of his sanctuary was cast down. Now I'm sure that all in our, all our Bibles, if we have the King James, we see that word sacrifice there as what? It's supplied. We also see this, in verse, see this in verse 12 and also 13. Every time the daily is given, the word sacrifice comes right after it. But in some instances, it might be in brackets or it might be in italics, telling us that sacrifice was not taken from the, the original, from the original Hebrew. That word sacrifice there has been supplied. It's been added. Now, the word daily is not a noun. It's not a noun, okay? What is it? When I, when I say I go to the store daily, what am, I, what am I saying? That's not a noun in a sense, the word daily there. What is it? What? English students? <laughs> Any here? It's an adjective. It's a describing an action. Okay? But when the people looked at it, when translators, when they looked at the word daily, and it was an adjective, and there was no noun attached to it, they had to attach something to it to make sense. You see what I mean? The noun for the what I say, I go to the store daily, what's the noun there? It's I. I is a noun. I go to the store daily. So it's describing something. But in this instance, when you look at the word daily, it's just by itself. It doesn't make sense to have it by itself. But yet, that word daily in the original does not mean an action word per se. The word daily simply means to continue. To continue. So we need to understand what continued from the past that is still there presently. This word daily, we need to help ourselves to understand what was in the past that continued on to the next power. Now in Daniel 2, what continued? Did gold continue into silver? No. Did silver into bronze? No. Bronze into metal or iron? No. But iron into clay? Yes. We see something continuing there. So from pagan Rome to papal Rome, something is continuing. We're seeing a connection come together already. All right? Daniel 7. Each beast passed away, but yet when the little horn came up, the fourth beast was still alive. It continued. It was still supporting the little horn. So in every instance that we've looked at in Daniel 2 and Daniel 7 so far, we're seeing something continue between pagan Rome and papal Rome. And this is the key. The daily helps us to understand in the little horn, something has continued. From where? Pagan Rome to papal Rome. And we're getting this picture to see here already that this little horn is pagan and papal in, in both sense. Okay? But the word, remember, in Daniel 8 and verse 11, we saw, and you see in your own Bibles, that the word sacrifice does not belong there. Now, Ellen White confirms this. In, page, in the book, Early Writings, pages 74 to 75. Okay? Early Writings, pages 74 to 75. She starts off like this. I have seen that the 1843 chart was directed by the hand of the Lord. The chart of 1843 was called the Millerite chart, and it had the Daniel 2, 7, 8, and 9 all lined up. I wish I had that with me. I've ordered it, and it's coming. 
but I really suggest that you get a hold of this. It's just called the 1843 chart, okay? Millerite chart. But it says, she confirms that the 1843 chart was directed by the hand of the Lord and that it should not be altered, that the figures were as He wanted them, that His hand was over and hid a mistake in some of the figures so that none could see it until His hand was removed. What was the mistake that was in there? The only mistake that she points out is that it ended in 1843. This is what we call when the pioneers thought that Jesus Christ was coming in 1843. They were tested first, but they went back to study the Bibles. Then it says, Then I saw in relation to the daily that the word sacrifice was supplied by man's wisdom. So she confirms it. That word sacrifice there should not be there. But why? When people were translating it, they thought, okay, it's describing something. Describing what? Well, daily, what's done daily? Sacrifice. Especially when they saw it in relation to the whole chapter, it's been more sanctuary message. So they just, man, simply in his own understanding, put the word sacrifice there. Okay? Let me finish though. Then I saw in relation to the daily, Daniel 8, 12, that the word sacrifice was supplied by man's wisdom and does not belong to the text, and that the Lord gave the correct view of it to those who gave the judgment our cry. So there was a correct view and existed with those who gave the judgment our cry. That was done around 1843-1844. When union existed before 1844, Nearly all were united on the correct view of the daily. But in the confusion since 1844, other views have been embraced and darkness and confusion have followed. Now, I'm no English expert, but I know by just looking at this, if we want to find the correct view of the daily, where should we be going then? From outside sources, outside of the Bible, where should we be going? We should be looking for books that are written by the pioneers during 1843-1844. Because they, she tells us that they gave the correct view of the daily. Not all of them, but she says, nearly all were united on the correct view of the daily. So you want to look for the majority opinion that existed during 1843-1844. Now, is daily an important thing to understand? Yes, because she said at the end there, but in the confusion since 1844, other views have been embraced and darkness and confusion have followed. If you have the wrong view of the daily, we're told that darkness and confusion may just follow you. It'll come. That means uh, the understanding of Daniel 8 won't be fully revealed. So it's important to have the correct understanding of that word daily. Now, if you can ever get your hands on an 1843 chart, and even an 1850 chart, it was just cleaned up. It was a cleaned up version of the 1843. What you have is a metal man standing there in Daniel 2. And it lines up with all the beasts, four of them, and then a little horn. And there's a lot of little text before it, in between it. And you're going to find that in between, going from the pagan to papal Rome, it's described what continues in Daniel 8, it is paganism. Paganism. Now I want you to write some references down, okay? The first one, You need to go back and do your research. The first one is called The Sanctuary, 1844, and The Pioneers. The Sanctuary, 1844, and The Pioneers. It's by a man named Paul Gordon. Paul Gordon. He wrote this book, and it has three of the pioneers on the front of it. A picture of three of the pioneers. And you see, what has happened is the reason why this book was written was because he wanted to refute against the claims of um, the new theology that was coming in about how sanctuary message has been changed. Why? Because people are changing the understanding of the 2300 days. And he says that we only prove the 2300 days because based on spiritual prophecy. So he wanted to show biblically that the sanctuary message in 1844 and these dates were all established biblically. And he quotes a lot of the pioneers. And one of the books that is mentioned in this book is the Second Advent by William Miller. Where William Miller points out that this word daily is paganism. 
Now you get this book, The Sanctuary, 1844 and the Pioneers. But people that were united on the understanding of the daily, the main people that came out, I mean, there's a lot more, but William Miller was one of them, Josiah Litch, Sylvester Bliss, Hiram Edson. So people like that, they were united on this understanding of the daily around the 1843-1844 time. So if you really want to get a clear understanding of who this daily is or what this daily is, you need to go back and search. I can't give you everything, unfortunately, in this class, in this sense. But you need to go back and look for old books. There's a blessing in old books. <laughs> you need to get these books and search out what were our pioneers thinking, 1843, 1844. What were they talking about, the daily? And you're going to find that their, the majority view during that time was that daily is paganism. Now we've looked at three proofs. We know that the word sanctuary, or daily sacrifice, pardon me, sacrifice, was a supplied word, that it does not exist. So with our understanding in mind, let's go over, starting with verse 11, all the way to 13. And it's going to be clear, you're going to see that transition from pa pagan Rome to papal. We've already established in verse 10, but let's go through it again, that verse 10 tells us that it is pagan Rome, okay? And it waxed great even to the host of heaven, and it cast down some of the host and of the stars to the ground and stamped upon them. Now we know that pagan Rome and also papal Rome both persecuted God's people. Pagan Rome how? Crucifixion of Jesus Christ, killing of the babies when Jesus Christ was born, even leveling of Jerusalem in AD 70 by the Roman armies. So definitely pagan Rome persecuted, but the thing that stood out was that word stamped in verse 10 and stamped upon them. Now come, come with me to Daniel 7 and verse 7. Just to reestablish our understanding that verse 10 in Daniel 8 is talking about pagan Rome. Daniel 7 and verse 7. After this I saw in the night visions, and behold a fourth beast, dreadful and terrible, and strong exceedingly, and it had great iron teeth, it devoured and brake in pieces, and what? stamped the residue with the feet of it. This is talking about pagan Rome then. And if you're taking details across and it's lining up, it's lining up with pagan Rome. But now, let's go into verse 11. Yea, he magnified himself even to the prince of the host, and by him the daily sacrifice was taken away, and the place of his sanctuary was cast down. Now, in verse 11, it says, Yea, he magnified himself even to the prince of the host. Religious aspect coming out. Religious persecution is different. It's still political entity. But this is religious aspect, religious characteristic coming out in this little horn now. Transition is taking place. Or we could say in Daniel 2, the clay is coming. Or the horn is rising out in Daniel 7. He magnified himself even to the prince of the host. That is Jesus Christ. And it says, by him. By who? Who is the him? Hmm? Mm -mm. Who is the subject matter here? Yea, he magnified himself into the prince of the host, and by him. The little horn. By him the daily was taken away. I left out the word sacrifice. But it says that by him the daily was taken away, and the place of his sanctuary. Whose sanctuary? little horn was cast down. Now you got to remember, in this verse, the transition is taking place. So what's happening is that this little horn is talked about, but in one instance is talking about pagan Rome, and the other instance is talking about papal Rome. But it's referred to as the same thing, him, little horn. Let's go through it again. Yea, he magnified himself even to the prince of the host, that is a little horn in its papal aspect coming out. Going against God, speaking blasphemous words against God, speaking great words against the Most High. And by Him, the daily was taken away. Now, paganism, it says, was taken away, was taken out of the way. But if you look at the original Hebrew word for the words taken away, right there, it means exalted. Exalt. So we're not, you know, the daily, when we look at this, when we say take it out of the way, they're subtracted, they're removed aside. 
But the original translation in the Hebrew, when it says that daily was taken away, it was actually exalted or incorporated. It was absorbed. So this daily was not in a sense cast down and thrown away. What was cast down here in this verse? The sanctuary. Now remember, this word sanctuary can refer either to pagan gods, idol, idols in their sanctuary or God's sanctuary. And it does make a distinction because in verse 13 and 14, the word sanctuary there can only be referring to God's sanctuary. So the place of His sanctuary, pagan Rome's sanctuary was cast down. But what was exalted? The daily paganism. And this is the transition that is taking place in verse 11. Now let me repeat this again, okay? Just to go over this again. Now in verse 11, it is talking about the little horn there. And it says the little horn magnifies himself against the prince of the host. Pagan Rome never did that. It was only papal Rome that went against God Almighty by calling themselves God, speaking great words against the Most High. So the little horn has already changed phase from verse 10, from pagan to papal. But it says, and by him the daily was taken away. The little horn took away or exalted the daily. And the place of his sanctuary was cast down. His referring still to the little horn, but in its pagan phase. There's a very smooth transition that you've got to see here that comes out. That what happened, how did this smooth transition happen in history? And we're pointing out history and events that happened. What happened here? I mean, if you go to the next verse, it says, and host was given him. Host is referring to armies there. So not only has paganism been absorbed now, but it's got also now the political entities of Rome. The iron coming out now. But what caused it to change was this word daily. Daily being exalted, but the sanctuary being cast down. And friends, if you go to Rome today, you, just, you find the pagan sanctuary is still there except that it's been baptized into Christianity, baptized into Catholicism. Now, I mean, you think about it. The, the Pope holds a staff, a rod, or whatever you call it. But on top of it, do you know what is, is there on top of this staff that he holds? One of them is an acorn. Do you know what that represented? No, not acorn. What am I talking about? Pine. <laughs> Pine cone. What did that represent? Fertility. You see it also has three on his breastplate. There's three there. I mean, come on. You think about it. Where did Easter bunnies come from? Why do Easter bunnies come out in Easter when it's got to do with meant to be the sacrifice of Jesus Christ, his death? What has Easter bunnies got to do with it? Nothing. What were rabbits used for or a symbol of? Fertility as well. Where did Christmas come from? All these things that have come to Christianity today is none other than its roots found in paganism. And what happened during that time in 508 AD when the Roman armies were pledged to the Catholic Church? What happened? Why was this pledge made? It was because this emperor went to war and he says, if I win, I'm going to become Catholic. His wife was Catholic. Does anybody know his name? Constantine. All right? He was married to a Catholic lady. And he said, if the armies win, Justinian and his armies, if they win, I'm going to become Catholic. And that's exactly what he did. He was a pagan king through and through. But what he did was he just marched his armies through the river and baptized them. He won. And he brought paganism into the church. He claimed to be Catholic, but really the pagans still found it easy to come in because they brought all the gods with them. That's why they changed the day from to Sunday, just worshipping the sun god. Still worshipping in church though. But what you're going to find if you go to Rome, all these symbols are still there, but it's just none other than baptized paganism. What has happened is that Constantine made it easy for the pagans to come to the church because really paganism was the ruling religion then. But he couldn't leave them out, so what he did was he just baptized it and brought it in. And you're going to find a lot of different things, like even in the churches. IHS, what do we, what do we think that stands for? In his service. But it's the name of three Egyptian gods. 
IHS. There's a lot of things that have come into our churches that we don't realize. But the smooth transition was papacy just cast down the pagan sanctuary and they brought in all the ideas and forms. So the pagans coming in, they still saw the forms, but they're just worshipping Mary now instead. So different things, the, st- the sunburst, standing upon the earth, different things, they're all there. Pagan, <laughs> pagan symbols that have come into the church. And it happened from 508 and certainly was established in 538. Where we see now in verse 12, and host was given him. Now, there we see papal supremacy. When the Catholic Church brings in paganism, but on top of that, armies are pledged to it. And you worship on this certain time, or else you're getting persecuted. So that is where Catholic Church, or the papacy, had been established as a world ruler now. Because armies were pledged to it. Okay? This is a lot of history behind it that I don't have time to share in this short amount of sessions that we have. But you need to go back, read Uriah Smith. That's the first book that I would recommend. But there are a lot of history books out there by A.T. Jones and different authors that write prolifically about 508 and also 538 and the time between it. And the so-called fake conversion of Justinian and his armies and also Constantine. All right, There's a lot of history to read behind that. But all I want to show you is this smooth transition and how this little horn shows us both the pagan Rome and also papal Rome aspects, both of them together. But the thing that continued on from pagan Rome to papal Rome was paganism. All the idol worshipping that came along with it. It was brought into the churches. So that is a transition. And then in verse 13, Pardon me, let's look at verse 12. And an host was given him against the daily by reason of transgression, and it cast the, down the truth to the ground, and it practiced and prospered. So verses 10 through 12, pagan to papal Rome transition, and now papal Rome in verse 12 comes out, cast the truth to the ground. And then verse 13, Then I heard one saint speaking, and another saint said unto that certain saint which spake, How long shall be the vision concerning the daily sacrifice and the transgression of desolation to give both the sanctuary and the host to be trodden underfoot. Now, how was it that papal Rome trod underfoot God's sanctuary? We don't see it in verse 11 or 12. But how did they tread underfoot God's sanctuary that was in heaven? They built an earthly sanctuary. What do we call that? Mass. They brought God's sanctuary, which should have established the believers that it was in heaven already, but they brought it down to earth. They set up Mass, introduction of Mass, casting down the truth to the ground. Yes, in that sense. But it's not there in verse 11 and 12. The Mass was introduced, but to eradicate or go against or disannul the understanding that existed a heavenly sanctuary. That's why there was confession boxes and all these things that were established. Forgiveness was given by the priests. Earthly sanctuary established to cast down or tread underfoot God's sanctuary. And then when this question is answered, Daniel asks, how long? And then verse 14, And he said unto me, 2,300 days, then shall the sanctuary be cleansed. And this gives us an understanding of why Daniel was troubled in verse 15. No. At the end of the chapter it says, but... Where was it? 27. Verse 17, I think. It says, right at the end it does say that he's troubled, but really, Daniel was troubled from the beginning, and that is why God gave him the interpretation straight away. And of course, we know the ram and the he goat. But one thing I want to point out here, let's read verses 15 through 17, okay? The answer comes, And it came to pass when I, even I, Daniel, had seen the vision and sought for the meaning. Then behold, there stood before me as the appearance of a man. And I heard a man's voice between the banks of Uli, which called and said, Gabriel, make this man to understand the vision. So he came near where I stood. And when he came, I was afraid and fell upon my face. But he said unto me, Understand, O son of man, for the time of the end shall be the vision. When shall be the vision? 
time of the end. Now notice, in verse 15, the word vision is seen there. Do you see that? And had seen the vision. Verse 16, it says right at the end, make this man to understand the vision. Verse 17, it says at the end, therefore, at the time of the end shall be the vision. Now, three times vision is mentioned, once each from verse 17, 15 through 17. There are two root words for this word vision. Two root words. The first one that we see in verse 15. The first one in verse 15 is the root word called chazon. C-H-A-Z-O-N. C-H-A-Z-O-N. That's chazon. That is the root word of the word vision there in verse 15. But in verse 16 and 17, it is the root word mare. M-A-R-E-H. M-A-R-E-H. So there's the distinction between the word vision in verse 15 as compared to the word vision in verse 16 and 17. Overall, generally, Daniel did not understand the whole vision. And that is why Gabriel told him in verse 20, 21, the ram is who? Medo-Persia. And the he-goat is Greece. Okay? And then he comes down, verses 22, all the way to 25. He explains the pagan and papal Rome. So that has been explained to him. Ram, he-goat, and little horn. All right? That was the chazon that he was interested in, the whole vision. But yet in verse 16, God says, Gabriel, make this man to understand the mare. He refers to the word vision, but yet it's a different part of the vision. And verse 17, it says, O son of man, for the time of the end shall be the vision. The time of the end shall be the mare. It's not the chazon, the whole vision that he's talking about here. It's just a specific part of this vision. Now come with me to verse 26. And the vision of the evening and the morning which was told is true. Wherefore shut thou up the vision, for it shall be for many days. There are two visions mentioned there. Okay? Two visions. The first one is Mare. The vision of the what? Evening and morning. And then in verse 26, right at the end there, it says, Shut thou up the vision. The word shut thou up just says, just means keep it secret. Don't say not, I don't understand it, but keep it secret. Shut down the vision. That word vision there is chazon. The first vision mentioned in verse 26 is mare, the vision of the evening and morning. Now, when we say evening and morning, what is this referring to? It's one whole day. In the beginning, God said, let there be light in the evening and the morning were the first day, second day, third day. So, this vision of the evening and morning is a vision of days, 2300 days. That's the only thing that has been mentioned so far. Daniel 8, 14. So that is the mare. So we're going back to verse 16 and 17. What we're seeing is that the vision, the mare, is what Gabriel was come to explain to Daniel. But Daniel fainted before Gabriel could explain it. He didn't get to it. He explained the ram, the eagle, and the little horn. But he didn't get to even explain this mare, the 2300 days, the vision of the evening and the morning. Because why? In verse 27, And I, Daniel, fainted, and was sick certain days. Afterward, I rose up and did the king's business, and I was, I was astonished at the vision, but none understood it. He was astonished at what? Verse 27 is mare. He was astonished at the 2300 days. And why did Daniel faint? Because you see, God had prophesied that Israel would be in captivity for 70 years. And after that, God's people will be allowed to go back to Jerusalem and rebuild again. But when God's, or well, when Daniel saw in verse 13 that the host and the sanctuary will be trodden underfoot, he thought that the sanctuary would be gone. And he says, how long? 2300 days now Daniel certainly had an understanding of time prophecy a day year time a day equals a year 
We see this in Numbers 14.34 and Ezekiel 4.6. But when he looked at this, he says, oh my, 2300 days, 2300 years, God's people will be in captivity. So he felt sick for his people. And that's why we understand the prayer in Daniel 9. He's praying, Lord, forgive us of our sins. Because of our sins, you're lengthening our, iniqui- our time in captivity. We deserve it, Lord, but forgive us. Please have mercy on us. So he's praying a prayer of forgiveness and a prayer of um, intercession for his people. Why? Because he thought that God had lengthened the time that they would be in captivity. He thought that this conditional prophecy was based on the faithfulness of God's people. And so he felt sick and he fainted. So I wanted to point this out to make it clear that in verse 17, when we look at this, it says, Understand at the end there, O son of man, for at the time of the end shall be the vision. So understanding the vision and its fulfillment will help us to understand when the time of the end begins. Okay? So verse 20, 21, we already know, it's clear. Medo, Persia, and Greece. Now I want to just go through verses 22 all the way to 25 to make clearer that this is pagan Rome and also papal Rome. All right? Let's look at verse 22. Now that being broken where I stood up for it, four kingdoms shall stand up out of the nation, but not in his power. Verse 22 that was. And certainly that's still describing Greece and the generals that came out of Greece after Alexander the Great died. Then verse 23. And in the latter time of their kingdom, when the transgressors are come to the full, a king of fierce countenance and understanding dark sentences shall stand up. This is a king of fierce countenance. Come with me to Deuteronomy. You know Moses prophesies of pagan Rome. Moses prophesies of pagan Rome. Let's go to Deuteronomy chapter 28. And verses 49 and 50. Deuteronomy chapter 28, verses 49 and 50. The Lord shall bring a nation against thee from far, from the end of the earth, as swift as the eagle flieth, a nation whose tongue thou shalt not understand, a nation of fierce countenance, which shall not regard the person of the young, of the old, nor show favor to the young. Verse 51, And he shall eat the fruit of thy cattle and the fruit of thy land, until thou be destroyed, which also shall not leave thee either corn, wine, or oil, or the increase of thy kind, or flocks of thy sheep, until he hath destroyed thee. Now verse 52, And he shall besiege thee in all thy gates, until thy high and fenced walls come down, wherein thou trusteth throughout all thy land, and he shall besiege thee in all thy gates, throughout all thy land which the Lord thy God hath given thee. Verse 53, the last one. And thou shalt eat the fruit of thine own body, the flesh of thy sons and of thy daughters, which the Lord thy God hath given thee in the siege and in the straightness wherewith thine enemies shall distress thee. This is talking about the destruction of Jerusalem. That time when the Roman armies will come and lay siege upon the walls of Jerusalem and there shall not be left one stone upon another. And that was that king of his countenance. But if we go back to Daniel chapter 8, and we looked at verse 23, this king of his countenance, that there in verse 20, did I say 28? I meant 23. Okay. In 23, it's describing their pagan Rome and how it's going to come and destroy Jerusalem. Now let's look at verse 24 and 25. And his power shall be mighty but not by his own power. There you go. You're seeing there how an host was given him, how an army was given over to the Catholic Church. Why? Because in itself, the Catholic Church can do nothing until it has or controls the armies. Then they can say whatever they want and the armies will reinforce their statements. So he stood up, but not of his own power. And he shall destroy wonderfully and shall prosper and practice and shall destroy the mighty and holy people, persecution of God's saints. 25, and through his policy also he shall cause craft to prosper in his hand, and he shall magnify himself in his heart, and by peace shall destroy many. He shall also stand up against the prince of princes, but he shall be broken without hand. And we saw the same aspect coming out there, broken without hand, in Daniel chapter 2. 
where we see the stone that was cut out without hands, it smote the image on the feet. The feet represented what? A, a combination of church and state. Combination of iron and clay, the political entity of Rome, and also paganism that continues in, and also the church. And that's when he'll be broken without hand. And in the same way, this power stands up against the prince of princes, but he shall be broken without hand as well, referring to the papacy. Now, when it says there, by peace, he shall destroy many. This certainly points out to papal Rome. Declaring peace. Let us not have so, so many differences by ourselves. And even this is going on even now. You know? And then you can understand why the Bible says, when they shall call out peace and safety. What comes soon after that? Destruction. Destruction. By peace he shall destroy many. And so, we're seeing here, this little horn. And you have to be able to see this before you go on, because the principle of repeat and enlarge applies, has to apply here, where we see Babylon in Daniel 2, 7 and 8. Then we're seeing Medo-Persia in 2, 7 and 8. Well, actually, we don't see Babylon in chapter 8, but we see it only in chapter 2 and 7. But we see Medo-Persia in chapter 2, chapter 7 and chapter 8. Greece as well. Pagan Rome has to exist there. So that's why you need to see this transition. But the thing that will help you to see it is that word daily. And the word daily will also help you to unlock the mystery that's also there in Revel uh, Daniel 12, where it talks about 1290 and also 1335. Now these figures are foreign to you at the moment, but that's okay. We'll get to it in Daniel 12. But you need to keep an understanding that word daily and its interpretation and be able to prove this word daily. Now I just want to leave you with one last quote that I feel is very important for you to see here and understand because some people say, well, daily is not a salvational issue. It's not. You're not going to go to hell thinking that the daily is high priestly ministry of Jesus Christ. But what it's going to do is going to bring in confusion. And we saw that with that quote where Sister White talked about how the word sacrifice was supplied by man's wisdom and should not be there. But I want to read to you one more quote. Okay. It's found in Manuscript 67. It's in the Manuscript releases. Manuscript 67, 1910, pages 1 through 8. Manuscript 67, 1910. Sister White writes here, I copy from my diary. The truth as it is in Jesus, talk it, pray it. Believe every word in its simplicity. What would you gain if mistakes are brought before the men who have departed from the faith and given heed to seducing spirits, men who were not long ago with us in the faith? So there were men that were faithful, that stood side by side with the pioneers, but they departed from the faith. And it says, will you stand on the devil's side? Give your attention to the unworked fields. A worldwide work is before us. I was given representations of John Kellogg. Now she brings up an example of a man who stood in the face, side by side, and then departed. It says, A very attractive, attractive personage was representing the ideas of the specious arguments that he was presenting, sentiments different from the genuine Bible truth. So he brings out this man, John Harvey Kellogg. We know him. Very, very famous man in, in Adventism, okay? But it says that he was, what, presenting things that were different from the genuine Bible truth. And those who are hungering and thirsting after something new were something new were advancing ideas so specious that Elder Prescott was in great danger. Elder Daniels was in great danger of becoming wrapped in a delusion that if these sentiments could be spoken everywhere, it would be as a new world. So now she brings out the two that she's addressing, Elder Prescott and Elder Daniels, and they exist they were there around the early nineteen hundreds. But she's addressing this issue. And what is this issue that is brought out? Yes, it would. But while their minds were thus absorbed, I was shown that Brother Daniels and Brother Prescott were weaving into their experience sentiments of a spiritualistic appearance and drawing our people to beautiful sentiments that would deceive, if possible, the very elect. I have to trace with my pen the fact that these brethren would see defects in their delusive ideas that would place the truth in an uncertainty. 
and yet they would stand out as if they had great spiritual discernment. So they were presenting something that looked as if people were looking at them and says, wow, these guys are very learned. They know what they're talking about. But yet it says that they're presenting something that would deceive even the very elect. Something very spiritualistic. Now I am to tell them that when I was shown this matter, when Elder Daniels was lifting up his voice like, voice like a trumpet in advocating his ideas of the daily, the word daily there is in quotes, referring to Daniel chapter 8. The after results were presented. So when Elder Daniels was presenting his views on the daily, Sister White saw the results of what happened after he presented the view. Our people were becoming confused. I saw the results and then there were given me cautions that if Elder Daniels without respect to the outcome should thus be impressed and let himself believe he was under the inspiration of God, skepticism would be sown among our ranks everywhere and we should be where Satan would carry his messages. Set unbelief and skepticism would be sown in human minds and strange crops of evil would take the place of truth. This was an issue that Ellen White had to write to Elder Daniels and Prescott when they were advocating their views of the daily. Now all you need to go and do is just find out what view they were presenting. That's all you need to do. And then you'll find out that the view that they were presenting would be opening the door to Satan to sow crops of evil and skepticism, unbelief. So is this an important issue to understand? Yes. Is it salvational? No, but at least a, an issue that could be salvational, deceiving the very elect. So we need to be able to be very clear in our mind what this daily is referring to. Now once again, I'm presenting the two before you. There's the high priestly ministry of Jesus Christ and also the paganism. I've shown you clearly that it cannot be the high priestly ministry of Jesus Christ because it is an evil entity, which we saw in Daniel chapter 8 and verse 13. So the daily there is none other than referring to paganism and how paganism was absorbed by the Catholic Church. But yet the sanctuaries were cast down, the pagan sanctuaries were cast down, but yet paganism still existed and it still exists today. It's still there. We need to be very careful in how we worship. Some things are there by tradition and we need to quote unquote clean it up to make sure that no pagan entities exist. Now, will God lead us in truth and light? Yes. I mean, all you need to do is get the illustrated great controversy. You heard of that before, right? How they have in between it two thick portions that they've added of pictures. It'll show you how paganism came into the church, how things were adopted from pagan, literally pagan sanctuaries and brought into the Catholic church and even into Christian churches today. It's there. What continued, that word daily to continue, what continued? It was paganism brought in from pagan churches into Christian churches. And it happened there in 508 up to 538 AD. So this is Daniel chapter 8. But what I wanted to really end off with was the thing that Daniel didn't understand. Now remember, there are four main sections to Daniel 8. The ram, the he-goat, the little horn, and also the 2300 days. All three, the first three, were clear, and we've seen that. But the thing that was unclear is the 2300 days. Now that needs to be explained because it says at the time of the end shall the vision be. And certainly we're living in the time of the end because papacy finished its reign in 1798. It received the deadly wound. But we need to understand about this 2300 days clearly what it is because it relates more to us than it is to Daniel. But the reason why Daniel fainted was he thought that it was relating to him and his people. So we're going to look at Daniel 9 in our next session, and we're going to see how Daniel 8 and Daniel 9 are connected, okay? Because they are consecutive now. Daniel 8 and 9 are consecutive with each other. And we need to see clearly how they relate to each other and how they explain one another, especially in the issue of the 2300 days. But that will be our next class. So for now, let's have a stop here and we'll have a word of prayer. Let's kneel. Father in heaven, I thank you so much for your word. But Lord, I also thank you for the spirit of prophecy that is there to guide us and lead us through the dark and stormy waters. 
Father, truly we're living in the last days. And this vision that we've been looking at, you told us, is for the last days. And so, Lord, I pray that you give us all a special measure of the Holy Spirit, that we may be able to have wisdom and discern truly the time that we're living in and the importance of the message that you're trying to tell us through Daniel chapter 8 and chapter 9. Bless us now, I pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen.